number one trait of an anti-hero. As Kate and I were preparing for this podcast, we were kind of thinking about the concept of anti-heroes and flawed heroes and trying to find the nuanced differences between mm. them because we did a episode about writing flawed heroes mm -hmm. and that was a really good episode, a story mining episode. So if you guys haven't seen that, we'll link it below. Um, but kind of considering the differences of like, okay, well, you have a hero with flaws and like internal conflicts and they make mistakes. So how are they different than an anti-hero? And I think the biggest difference is that an anti-hero character knows what they're doing is morally wrong, but they do it anyway. Right. Like with knowledge of the fact that like going into it, they're like, I know this is wrong and I know it's going to hurt people, but I'm still going to do it anyway. So I think this is like the number one distinguisher between an anti-hero and a flawed hero. Because where a flawed hero will act out of weakness and their fatal flaws, the anti-hero is still acting out of their fatal flaws, but they're like fully conscious of the fact that what they're about to do is going to be impacting others negatively, but they do it anyway. Right. So in many <laughs> cases, it's that the motivations are different. Yeah. The driving force behind it, and obviously not all right. cases, but in many, and especially the examples we're identifying here, yeah. it's that they're coming at this um, this battle plan of theirs from a place of selfishness, yes. fundamentally. Even if they don't consciously recognize it, they because they are constantly making choices that better them even if it hurts others, it ultimately makes their decisions selfish. Mm -hmm. Whereas a flawed hero may struggle with making the choice, but will ultimately make a decision that will help other people or at least not hurt them or put them in harm's way. Right. Where So we have that moral compass that will be much stronger for a flawed hero who may struggle with decision making, but won't consciously make the wrong decision that will hurt other people. Right. Exactly. So true. And I feel like you did an amazing job of this in your Sparrow series with the character of Aaron Price, who is probably my favorite character in that series. And he's Same. like I just such so a classic, morally gray, very internally tortured character. He's definitely an anti-hero because he's not like the villain, but his actions and decisions we can see are born from this place of like deep internal conflict and this struggle to belong and to feel like he has this place in the world and he's kind of always felt like an outcast in a way um, because of his powers, because of his history and his past and so much good, wonderful backstory for mm -hmm. his character. But we see him go about doing the wrong things Right. for what he thinks are the right reasons. And that's kind of like the qualifier, I think, is like, can your can your character who's an anti-hero like reason with themselves of like, yes, I know that what I'm about to do is gonna be harmful and maybe hurtful to people, but I have to do it for X, Y, Z reasons. Like there are, there's a reasonable explanation for why I'm doing this and the ends justify the means. Mm -hmm. You know, and I feel like, Aaron's character does that a lot in the Sparrow series where you see him like kind of manipulating Sparrow and using her to his for his own ends right. and his own gains. But at the same time, he's kind of torn by this love he has for Sparrow too. And it's like you, you see the battle inside the character. And when you see the battle happening, that's like, what makes you fall in love with them, I think. Because you right. see that they do have a heart deep down. Right. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Yeah. And and it also creates not so much justifying what they're doing, but it, it creates understanding for the reader. Because in, in the case of Corporal Aaron Price, his character in the Sparrow series, he has to make this impossible decision over because of his superpowers, he's invisible to everyone on earth except for this one person who is Sparrow. So does he keep her for his own selfish reasons or does he let her go free? There's a lot more complexity to it than that, but that's the very basic um, premise here. And because we see his pain of never being able to be seen by anyone, and we start to imagine what would that be like to have to live an existence like that. Right. So we can almost understand the pull and the allure of 
wanting that, yes, wanting to keep that one person who can see you, even if it's um, through means that aren't necessarily um, good or they're very selfish reasons, but we can understand why he's struggling with it. So even though it doesn't justify this, these selfish behaviors that the character is exhibiting, we understand the struggle. And that's a, that's a big part, I think, of what makes us as human beings um, who struggle and deal with flaws and conflicts to, to relate. Mm-hmm. We, we get it. We relate. We're like, yeah. oh, yeah, that's tough. It's actually a similar struggle to, um, and I know this is an example that we've written down, but this just came to my head, is like Chris Pratt's character in the movie Passengers. Very similar yeah. conflict in like, you know, okay, we're on this spaceship. I'm the only one who, who's awake. And am I going to wake up Jennifer Lawrence's character? I can't remember either of the character's names. I think her but, name is Aurora. Right. So am I going to wake her up even though I know there's no way to put her back to sleep and this yeah. spaceship's going to go off into space for 80 years and... And he has to make, but we see how much he's struggling. It's so devastating to watch. And it's like, oh, we can feel just how gut-wrenching it is imagining us in the place of that character. So even though the action itself, mm, not really justifiable because it's like, you know, you're, you're, you're doing it for selfish reasons, but we can understand why the character is doing it. And that's what creates that connection. And it's the same with um, Corporal Aaron. Aaron Price's character in the Sparrow series is we we see throughout the two books, Searching for Sparrow and Sparrow Rising, how tortured and lonely this character is when we start connecting with those qualities of loneliness and and anguish. Those are very basic primal human experiences that we can relate to and connect to with our own experiences. And we can understand what's driving this character forward. And that is part of what makes them not seem like a purely evil villain. Right. Because it's not just like, moha, I'm doing this because I want to be evil. It's actually they're they're dealing with their own suffering, but in all the wrong ways. Yes, exactly. And that's one of the things that I think makes antiheroes compelling and strong characters stronger to and more compelling to read about in a lot of cases than the heroes because it's when you are developing an anti-hero a lot of times you are putting way more focus and attention on what they want and why they want it because you're digging deep into the the reasons why why would somebody be motivated to do something that's morally wrong to achieve this end so I think that's what makes us love them so much is because their goals are so clear, their motivations are so clear. And it's easy for us to connect the dots and see how their internal conflict relates to their mission. It's like very clear and very obvious. And another um, morally gray or, or anti-hero character that immediately comes to mind is Dimitri from Anastasia, who's probably like one of my favorite anti-heroes because <laughs> we, grew, well we grew up watching Anastasia, yeah. loving that film. And just the, the hate to love romance is fantastic also. But Dimitri's character, how he's kind of just like going about getting what he wants <laughs> in all the selfish ways. He's basically using Anastasia or Anya to get all this money from her grandmother who he doesn't even think is her real grandmother until he finds out at the very end. Um, In fact, oddly enough, we're going to Paris ourselves. Uh, And I've got three, uh, well, this one is, but I've I've got three tickets here. Uh, Unfortunately, the third one is for her, Anastasia. The motivation is basically like, I want to be free, I want this money. And that's kind of like, that's kind of the clear goal. Like. And as he continues down the path of, like, conning this woman into believing that Anya is her granddaughter and and her long-lost, you know, relative that she's been looking for this whole time, and that whole ruse, that whole uh, manipulation that's set up, we can clearly see why he's doing it, and it makes sense, you know? the, The ends, he thinks the ends justify the means. Look, I think we got off on the wrong foot. Well, I think we did too. Okay. But I appreciate your apology. Apology? Who said anything about an apology? I was just saying Please, that d- we... don't talk anymore, okay? It's only gonna upset me. Fine. I'll be quiet. I'll be quiet if you will. All right, I'll be quiet. Fine. 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 But slowly, as time goes on, he begins to have a character arc, and we're gonna talk about character arcs in a little bit. But that's another great example of, like, an anti-hero with very clear goals and a very clear objective, and we can see why he's doing what he's doing. <laughs> like, it's, it makes sense. Yet you want no reward. Not anymore. Why the change of mind? 
It was more a change of heart. I must go. And another example that comes to mind, which is very similar, actually, I was contemplating how similar this is, is Flynn Rider from Tangled. Because mm-hmm. um, he's kind of, even though he ends up being heroic, at the end of the story, he starts as kind of an anti-hero. I can't believe that after all we've been through together, you don't trust me? Ouch. Where he's a thief. <laughs> he wants to, you know make money and and be free again like dimitri um and of course not work for it he wants to steal it where is my satchel i've hidden it it's in that pot isn't it so he ends up having this transformation of course where he ends up helping rapunzel and falling in love with her and then risking actually sacrificing his life at the end to save her but in the beginning we see the stakes are clearly set of like she has the precious crown that I need to sell, to make money, <laughs> to be free, to have the life I want. Very clear dots to connect, right? Mm-hmm. And so we can like clearly follow that little path to the char- back to the character's deepest motivations and see what drives them. A book I used to read every night to all the younger kids, The Tales of Flanagan Rider, swashbuckling rogue. He had enough money to do anything that he wanted to do. He could go anywhere that he wanted to go. And, and, and for a kid with nothing, I don't know. I, it just seemed like the better option. And it doesn't always have to be like a physical like thing, like, you know, all antiheroes care about is money. Like, <laughs> that doesn't, that's not always the case. Sometimes it's more deeply rooted into their internal conflict, like you were saying with, right. with Corporal Price in your book. Um, it's more rooted to his sense of identity and, and feeling loved mm. um, and that he wants to feel seen and loved and has never experienced that. But he's also dealing with this revenge from his past um, involving the anomalies and how they've um, you know, impacted his life in a negative way. So he's kind of dealing with so many different layers of conflict and sense of identity can be a really interesting conflict to dig into with yeah. an anti-hero um and one another anti-hero that comes to mind and some people might consider this more of a villain character um but in this particular film i would call him more of an anti-hero and that is the character of loki from the first thor movie in the mcu so he kind of slowly becomes the villain throughout the course of that film but in the beginning and throughout quite a bit of it i would consider him more of an anti-hero in that He's kind of still bros with Thor. He's like still palling around with Thor and like part of the squad. And he's not really looked at as like a big threat by anybody. But we see that he's deeply insecure and he wants to be the king of Asgard and he will do literally whatever it takes to be the king, to be better than everyone because he has this inferiority complex of like believing himself to be an outsider, an outcast and not one of them. And so that's like, the springboard like the deeply rooted misbelief is that he is not one of them he doesn't belong and that he's different and that he um can't have a place in in their world so i am no more than another stolen relic locked up here until you might have use of me why'd you twist my words you could have told me what i was from the beginning why didn't you Right, that's really the birthplace of all the resentment and conflict that then follows to make up the rest of the stories is is this inferiority he feels about not belonging Mm -hmm. and not having uh, a place in in society and in his family. He feels like he's not as much a member of the family. And so that's a really great example of identity complexity, feeling like, um, you know, those really multi-layered conflicts that's yeah. not so much something he's trying to get it's something he wants to be but feels he isn't why have you done this to prove to father that i am a worthy son when he wakes i will have saved his life i will have destroyed that race of monsters and i will be true heir to the throne yes so exactly. the, these are good questions to ask yourself as you're crafting an anti-hero is like <clears throat> is it is it that they're making selfish decisions or destructive decisions based off of something they want to get or achieve? Or is it something that they feel that they are not? Mm-hmm. And so they're actually in a defense mode of how do I sort of build this wall around myself to protect myself from ever having to face up to the truth that I might not be this thing that I think I am. 
Yeah. And really, isn't that like the, isn't that at the core of like all character conflicts, even if it seems like their goal is more on the surface or like more of a surface level, um, you know, achievable, quantifiable thing, like really beneath the surface, it all comes from this sense of like who they are, you know, who they want to be. So that's a really good, really good question to ask yourself and start digging into.